Hi, welcome to my bookshop. My name is Kim Greenblatt, and we've got a great show lined up for you today. We've got June Ferre on as our special guest, and I'd like to introduce everybody out there. June, uh, I want to thank you very much for taking the time uh, to come out on the show. Oh, it's a great pleasure to be here, really. Yeah, great. Um, June, if uh, you've been living in a cave for the last 20 to uh, X number of years, um, June has been doing the voiceovers and exceptionally well, I might add, Thank you. for uh, several hundred cartoon characters as well as for commercials on the radio, some hidden people on television, and uh, generally I was very pleased to find out that she's very well-rounded in all senses of the word. Uh, and very Not active. too well-rounded. Well, I meant Come that, I meant that <laughs> more in the attractive okay. way. Okay, terrific. <laughs> um, but, uh, but tell us, I guess, basically, um, something about yourself, how you got started over in uh, the business, June. Well, I always wanted to be an actress, ever since I was six years old. And I got lessons, and, which I hated, and I broke a finger playing baseball. With and um, I took dancing lessons, and I really wanted to be an actress, so my mother gave me wonderful teachers at that time. And I went into radio professionally when I was 12 or 13 years old. This was in Massachusetts. And um, I, o I only grew to be 4 feet 11. So what is a, a girl 4 feet 11 going to do to be on the stage, you know? So I went into radio instead. And then from radio, I went into uh, making records with Stan Freeberg. I was put under contract with Stan and Dawes Butler. God love him. And uh, we did all of the Disney and, and Warner shorts and features. And Disney heard about me and said, hey, she should be working over here in animation. And I inadvertently fell into it, really. That's something. Um, you've been involved very politically since the beginning with a, a lot of key features, which uh, a lot of fans, such as myself, and people involved with animation, I guess, may or may not take for granted. Um, you were, I guess, one of the people who campaigned for the sales of cells originally. Oh, yes. I was president of ASIFA Hollywood. It's an acronym for uh, Association Internationale du Film d'Animation. So thankfully, it's been truncated to ASIFA. It's an international organization of people in animation. And uh, there are about 35, 36 countries. Yeah. And I was president of ASIFA Hollywood for six years. And I thought, how are we going to, we're an Ely Masonary organization. And how are we going to survive? We need to, to pay somebody to, for the telephone and, and, and mailings and so forth. So I thought of the idea of selling cells. And so all of the studios would give us cells, the Warner Brothers, MGM, everybody gave us wonderful cells, Walter Lance. And then all of a sudden, the studios said, hey, wait a minute, we can be wait making that kind of money too. So um, in the last couple of years, they've been selling their own cells, and uh, so ours has sort of fallen by the wayside, but it's, um, it was uh, a very exciting thing. And I started the Annie Awards uh, for animation, of course, and we've given them to Chuck Jones and Fris Freeling and Tex Avery, and, and uh, this year we're giving it to uh, Ralph Bakshi mm. and Bob Clampett and Virgil Ross, and um, uh, Kiyachiro Kawamoto, who is a very marvelous puppet maker in, in Japan. So he's coming over for that, too. What was it like working with these greats of animation, uh, Fritz Freeling and, and with Disney and with Bob Clampett? It's, um, it's, a, it's such a gratifying experience that I, I'm really going to write my autobiography about it because I think I'm the only woman. Chuck Jones, um, after he left Warner Brothers, after it closed in 1968, something like that, uh, Chuck opened, uh, he went to MGM and I did all of the his uh, specials, Horton Hears a Who and mm -hmm. The Cricket in Times Square and um, uh, The Dot and the Line. And then he went into, into his own studio for a while and, and did specials, did all of those. And uh, I continued to see him. Uh, I was in London 
a couple of months ago, and Chuck was there as well uh, for the National Film Theater. And uh, we were we both gave uh, lectures at different times to different people in, in National Film Theater. And um, I saw Frizz Freeling last night at the Motion Picture Academy. I'm on the board there uh, representing short films. Naturally, I'm 4'11", so I'd be representing short films, well, naturally. Good things come in small <laughs> packages. It's a cliche, but it's true, <laughs> well, especially in your case. Um, I don't know where to begin about your characters. Uh, you've been Natasha. You've been Rocky. You're Nell. Jokey Smurf. Uh, Witch Hazel. And uh, Grammy Gummy. And Gram can't forget Grammy Gummy on the Gummy Bears. I, uh, Grammy Gummy on the Gummy Bears. I've been wanting to do this for a while. If I do a Bullwinkle, can you do a Rocky for me? Sure. Okay. Hey, Jean, so can you tell us something about uh, Rocky and uh, what was it like uh, doing the voiceovers and how do you do the voiceovers over with the cartoons? Well, Hokey Smoke, you know, I just flew in from Frostbite Falls just to be here. And, um, well, you know, we record first. Uh, and, um, of course, Bullwinkle and Natasha. Don't forget Natasha, darling. All right, I won't. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, it's fun. You know, we record first. And, um, and then the animators come in and animate to that. Oh, okay. So that is the opposite then of... Um I guess you were saying before, over in Japan, we were talking. Earlier. Yes, over in Japan, they, they do just the opposite, and the, the poor slob of an actor has to come in and watch the monitor all the time. And, um, and, and he stays there all day, you know, because they're locked in for time. But um, anyway, it's a, it's a very gratifying and wonderful uh, profession to be in. You know, I have so much time to myself as well, and I, I work a lot. And um, on Roger Rabbit, I think I had, uh, we did what I had to do in about five days, working only about three hours at a time. And um, on the Gummy Bears, if we do, say, a 12-minute segment, we're out in an hour and a half. Mm. Uh, if On Jokey Smurf, you know. <laughs> um, if we do the Smurfs, Gordon Hunt is such a marvelous director over at Hanna-Barbera. And if we do a half-hour show, we're out in two hours at the most. That's we just good. go right along. So uh, it's marvelous. Uh, you laugh all the way to the bank, and, <laughs> and you have wonderful bagels and, and sweet rolls and everything at the studio, and you have a lot of fun. You tell jokes, and, and, but then you become serious, of course, when you, uh, when you record. Um, at this point, probably all 180,000 households out there, they're drooling and chomping at the bit on how to get in on such a sweet racket like voiceovers. And you, you taught voiceovers in, for a while, didn't you? Over? Yes, I, I taught at USC for seven years. Well, then you're, you must be the high priestess who one and all would come to uh, for information. My classes were always full, I must say that. But it, it was a little restricting. I like to get on a plane and go to China or Russia or... <laughs> or England or Frostbite Kenya, Falls. you know. And, and, yeah. Frostbite Falls, sure. <laughs> Pennsylvania, darling. Pennsylvania. Can't miss Pennsylvania there. <laughs> but um, would you say then uh, it's harder to break in doing voiceovers now? Or is it the same old thing, it's just perseverance? It's perseverance. Well, first you have to confirm the fact that you have talent. You know, if... Uh, uh, if you're not talented, I know a lot of my students would come to me and say, hey, listen to the voices I do, and they would do wonderful voices. But you have to be an actor, too. You know, you have to be able to pick up a script and read it cold and, and uh, assume the persona of that creature, whether it's an, an anthropomorphic creature or a human being or whatever it is. You have to assume that personality and, uh, and have light and shade and transition and um, if, if you're not capable of doing that, forget it. You know, a lot of people, it's very unfortunate, have, um, uh, have the good fortune to maybe hit a, a, a good voice to do on a series. But then I've seen so many people replaced. The voice, yes. the voice has been good, but 
the attack wasn't there, the energy. You have to have a lot of actor's energy as well. You know, you have to really get in there and, and uh, um, a lot of people, you know, drugs at parties put on lampshades and they have no <laughs> inhibitions. Well, uh, voice actors have to do the same thing, you know. When I do Witch Hazel, you know, uh, my throat doesn't bother me, but <laughs> you know when I go like this, <laughs> you know, I use this body English, and by the time I get home, I have such a neck ache. <laughs> I can't stand it. Um, oh, thank you. Uh, one hears about also the Boris and Natasha are going to be making a comeback as well as Bullwinkle. Yeah, they're going to be uh, live action. Sally Kellerman and. Uh, Dave Thomas, I believe, of SCTV. They're going to do a live-action Boris and Natasha. N Dave Thomas, I guess he can do the voice. I heard him on SCTV. He can do it. But what's your opinion of him, of uh, Boris? He's a good choice, or have you? Seen I him don't before? even know what he looks like, frankly. <laughs> I've never seen him. Okay. So I, I have no idea. I understand he's a very talented man. Does he look like Boris? Is, well, he's is a little he short? tall. He's a oh, little he tall? tall. He was part of the McKenzie brothers over, I don't know, the, the Great White North. They did this thing on SCTV. They were always drunk, and they would fry that. Canadian sausage and stuff like that. Ah. Um, but the important thing is also, I guess, you're going to have a part in it, too. Yeah, which is, they want me to do a cameo in it, I guess, for all my fans and the Bullwinkle fans, you know. I don't know what I... I, I of course, I won't be doing Natasha Dudding. If I were taller and thinner and younger and more beautiful, I could do Natasha the way Sally Kellerman is doing it. But I think she'll be a terrific Natasha. Well, I think you're beautiful, too, the way you are. Oh. Don't sell yourself <laughs> short, if you'll pardon Thank the you. pun. Um, what could you say about uh, some of the characters which you're doing now? Uh, you do Ma Dweeb on Slimer. Have yeah, she's a, she's a real uh, slob, you know? <laughs> she, uh, she sits and watches television all the time. She doesn't want to be bothered with anybody. <laughs> Obviously, then, you have no bones about positive or negative role models, especially since oh, most of these... Yeah. Okay, that's so good. Cause you know, I love to do great, big, heavy voices like this because, you know, being a, a little person, uh, seeing that come out of my mouth, it, it kind of startles people <laughs> a little bit. Um, did you ever do any crank phone calls with different voices? Or no. Have you, uh, I, I'm sorry, I wouldn't impose such a refined I, person like yourself, but uh, what kind of stunts or anything of the mischievous sort would you have done, say, back on some of the shows which you worked on? Uh, as a, as a, as an actress, yeah, as an well, actress I was on Truth or Consequences a lot. Oh, <laughs> you know, uh, the, they would have to, um, they would talk to people say down in Texas. Uh, I, I remember one, and I, I wrote the line, and then they thought it was very funny, and they kept it in. Um, a, a woman was going to win a, a washing machine or something. If she could get to talk to a lady down in Texas to answer a question. And so uh, I answered. I was, of course, backstage uh, at a microphone, and she thought she was calling Texas. And um, I answered as a little boy. And she said, uh, hey, hey, listen, I, I've got to talk to, to somebody. Is your mother there? And I said, well, no, my mother isn't here. And he said, would you like to talk to my sister? And she said, yes, yes, please, put your sister on. And then I came back just about 10 seconds later, and I said, I'm sorry, I can't lift her out of the crib. Oh, so that was kind of a funny thing. So those are some of the mischievous things I did uh, say, you know, on shows, but myself, I, I think I have a good sense of humor, but I, I, don't, I don't play uh, mischievous tricks on people. I just That's nice, that. though. But as a nice segue over to uh, some people who did, I guess Jay Ward, some people just couldn't take a joke from uh, Rocky and Bullwinkle because there was that stink about the Kerwood Derby. Oh, um, yes. It, I take it what he just, uh, Derwood Kirby, who used to be I, I keep forgetting if it was either Candid Camera or Gary Moore. I don't know which I one it was. I can't remember either. And what exactly? But he was an announcer. Yeah. And uh, so Bill Scott, who was the voice of Bullwinkle and Super Chicken and George of the Jungle and Tom Slick mm. and Dudley Do Right, and <laughs> I, you know, played all of Ursula and, ah. and Little Nell and so forth. Um, Bill did the voice of um, of 
Bullwinkle, and he wrote most of the segments. And uh, so he thought of the idea of, of just transposing those two letters so it, it was the Derwood, uh, the Kerwood Derby. <laughs> now I'm all mixed yeah. up. And every time Bullwinkle put it on, it got awfully smart, you know. And uh, so Derwood Kirby was very upset about that. Mm -hmm. And then also Red Skelton was upset. He thought that uh, Bullwinkle sounded like Clem Cadiddlehopper, you know. But that's all gone by. It's, it's now become such a cult. And it was so brilliantly written. Yes. Brilliantly written. We offended everybody. <laughs> that's great. Um, I guess to go now from the offending everyone on television to I guess helping everyone too. You're very involved politically, and you mentioned something. You were the organizer of the 1973 Mead boycott with Senator Humphrey. Yeah. How did you get involved with that? I mean, I'm astounded at just the 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 height and breadth of uh, the activities you were involved. In. Well, at that time, uh, the price of meat hamburger went up to like two fifty or three dollars a pound. It was outrageous, really. And um, a friend of mine, uh, it, it was in the times that some women in New York or, or Boston or someplace back east um, were protesting the price of meat. So I talked to a friend of mine and, and um, we said, well, why don't we start it here in the San Fernando Valley? Well, uh, Michael Jackson put me on the show, his show, and it just, it just, burgeoned it, it, it uh, overnight NBC came to my home and from from that night on for months uh, it was we started we set April Fool's Day for it and uh, it just uh, it just skyrocketed and and uh, Hubert Humphrey his office called my home and said I would like you to testify before the Joint Economic Committee oh, gee. And which I did, and uh, Congressman Benjamin Rosenthal had me chair a conference with Betty Furness, mm. and uh, I was audited for ten years mm. because uh, at the time um, the current administration uh, the current sort of administration gave feedback didn't like poor it. feedback to that sort of stuff right because I I would keep answering them. They'd say, well, the president is saying this, and, and uh, the secretary of agriculture is saying this. What do you say? And I say, well, we still go on, you know. We boycott. And, uh, but that's all over. Okay. I, I was stopped by the IRS for 10 years. So it's over in 1983. <laughs> That's well, fine. Congratulations and good show. I mean, further proof what a great trooper you are. And you're a writer on top yes. of this, too. You are working on your own novel, which I want an autographed, personalized copy so we can review it on the show, have you back on. It's not a novel. It's an autobiography. I'm sorry. Auto but I, I've written about 300 kid stories that I had on the air that I uh, wrote and produced and acted in on the air. And I write articles for magazines about animation all over the world. And uh, I'm busy. <laughs> and I'm on the Board so of Governors of the Motion Picture Academy and uh, uh, the Record Academy, NARIS. And uh, I used to be on, on the AFTRA board, but I just, <laughs> I just became so busy. I, I, I just can't uh, splice myself up into that many little bitty pieces anymore. <laughs> What kind of movies do you like, or what does June Foray like to see when she goes to the theater? Oh, I'm a rotten sentimentalist. You know, I, I, I like movies that tug at the heart. I, uh, Casablanca, I love. Mm -hmm. um, Doctor Strangelove, of course, mm -hmm. was one of my favorite films. You know, there are a few favorite films, um, but I. Uh, I used to love horror stories. I used to love um, all of the vampire and the living dead. The ones now are too violent. I, I can't stand those. But you know, when Belly, Bella Lugosi uh, nicked at your neck, you, you, you didn't see all the gore and horrible. Yeah. You just saw him leaning down. And you know, I, I loved things like that. And the zombie films, you know, the living dead knocking on the doors at night. But um, I like. I like bright comedy. I um, th th there are some very good films. I thought Big was a very 
fine film. I didn't expect to like that, huh. but it, it, it was a charming film. I liked uh, Midnight Run with Robert De Niro and Grodin. I, I thought that was great. Um, there are some that I, I've been disappointed in that I've been seeing lately, and you know, they've gotten good reviews, and I, I was rather bored okay. by them. Well, June, I want to thank you very much for coming on the show. And I hope I haven't talked a leg and an arm off you. Um, what makes you say that? Uh, you, know, um, you did just fine, and um, I'm looking forward to having you on again. If nothing else, we can just talk. Maybe we can... I've got some cooking books. Maybe we'll either exchange recipes, or we can go to the local Pick and Save, which is a local store here in Southern California, and we'll just go shopping for bargains for 79 cents or something. Why not? And okay. I love to cook. There you go, so we'll have some stuff. Okay, there. thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you for inviting me, well, Kim. Well, it's my pleasure and all of our pleasure, June. Um, what I'd like to do now, though, is since this is a book show, <laughs> is touch on some books. Um, hopefully I'll have an inside monitor here on so I can see, as well as you people at home can see, what books I'm going to briefly touch on as uh, they prepare the roll-in tape for it. Um, my book shop, uh, The Slant for Today's Show, has been towards comic books and towards uh, animation and as soon as I can see uh, what's coming up um, I don't know can Michael or somebody let me know if there's anything coming through I can let you know then we thank you it's gonna be really interesting the books which you're gonna be seeing um, I've gone through them. I read everything which I get, contrary to what most people think. Every stack of comic books I get and regular books, I go through them. I also um, have my own personal uh, choices, I guess like June has for her for movies too. And this is going to be just some of the stuff which I kind of think you might want to take a look at. Also, before I forget, there's a, a society called the Associated Reading Service. Um, it's comic books for literacy. The purpose is to get kids and adults reading, okay? And the way which you do this is through comic books. They have a disgusting acronym called ARS. They should, someone should have sat down and just told them the secret for acronyms, you know, ARS. Uh, but besides that, they have all sorts of programs for literacy, and they've got uh, recommendations what kind of comic books you should read for the uh, the different things. Uh, Doug Wildey, who I'm I'm very uh, happy uh, to have met over at uh, the San Diego Comic Con several times. Doug Wildey uh, has done Rio, which is a great book on westerns. He also has uh, been working in animation too. He worked over on Johnny Quest, and maybe I'm going to try and have him on a later show. In the meantime, uh, some of the books which you might be interested from. Uh, hero Publishing. They have a line of superhero comics. They've got also Marvel came out with the Silver Surfer graphic novel. Superman. There is Superman at 50. Because it's the 50th year of Superman's anniversary, you're going to be wanting to take a look at that book. Great book. Great essays. Introduction by Harlan Ellison. There's the Superman book, which has the greatest Superman stories ever told. The jury is out on that. I'm not quite sure if they're the greatest. The book's pretty good. If you haven't read James Ilroy's book, The Black Dahlia, go ahead and pick it up if you like hard-boiled detective stories. It's his interpretation of what happened with the Black Dahlia murders here in Southern California. Interesting thing, too, is there's the Chaluthu <laughs> Society uh, Diploma, which, uh, if you're a follower of H.P. Lovecraft, very interesting. Uh, there's also the illustrations are by... Uh, S. Gross, who you may have seen him in National Lampoon and other magazines. Some other books. Ms. Tree by Michael Collins and Gary Cato. There's a brief synopsis of some of their stories over in black and white paperback. Uh, I believe they're doing Wild Dog now over as part of Action Comics over at DC. And that's just some of uh, the interesting things which we have over for the, um, I guess, recommended list. Um, there's no such thing as a bad book. Perhaps something less than good, but there's definitely no such thing as a bad book. Um, if you're a follower of mysteries, I'm going to try and have the author of To Live and Die in L.A. over on the show. George R.R. R. Martin mentioned that when he gets some time, he'll be on the show. George R.R. R. Martin, 
Um, he's the story editor for Beauty and the Beast, as well as a noted science fiction and fantasy writer. Rocky and Bullwinkle, the Antioch calendar, um, it's a little bit late in the year to pick it up, but it was, came out by Antioch. It had all the pictures which you've seen of Rocky and Bullwinkle. And uh, Blackthorn is coming out with a, the second 3D Rocky and Bullwinkle. Uh, wake up out there, Blackthorn, and go ahead and uh, send me a copy. We can review it over on the show. And Rocky and Bullwinkle as well is also coming out as part of the star line of comics from Marvel. And let's see, what else have I missed or failed to touch on? I think that pretty much covers it. Uh, if I can think of anything else, uh, I'll let you know. Be sure to send over your uh, cards and letters to the address at the end of the show. So hurry up, skitter out, get your pad and paper. I want to get mail from you. Whatever you want me to review or touch on, I'll be more than happy to. Tell me if you like this show. Tell me if you like any of the shows. Send me pictures of your parents naked. I'm kidding. That's my standard closing line. Um, again, I want to thank June Foray for um, having the guts and the audacity to come on the show. She's uh, lovely, talented. Everyone out there in Beverly Hills and Hollywood, you should hire her more and keep her busy. She's a very good writer as well as talented person. And until we meet again, um, stay well, stay healthy, get wealthy, uh, tune into my bookshop and my computer shop, and until we meet again, adios. Thank you again.